So we got a pretty big chapter this week, a bunch of things to talk about. This chapter also really solidified my stance on Sukuna being an amazing antagonist within the shonen sphere. Like, I'll be honest, before, I've always thought Sukuna was great, but there was still something missing that just didn't make him a, a top tier antagonist for me yet. However, that's now changed. I'm really happy with how Gege is writing Sukuna here. And of course, we'll get into all that discussion in this review. So without wasting any more time, let's get straight into it. So picking up from last week when Sukuna transformed into his original <laughs> old Hin era body, Kashimo analyzes his true form via looking through some enhanced x-ray eyes. As we learned in the last chapter, that Kashimo's mythical beast technique can reshape his body and manifest any phenomena that revolves around his electrical cursed energy trait. So Kashimo uses his electricity to reshape his eyes, enhancing them to a degree where it's like having x-ray vision. And yeah, as I stated earlier, he examines this form of Sukuna being absolute perfection because as a Jujutsu sorcerer, there's no greater advantage than having twice the amount of arms and mouth. Specifically with four arms, Sukuna can now do hand signs while simultaneously having his other two hands free for combat and now having two mouths. Sakuna can chant incantations while simultaneously having another open mouth for him to talk or speak through. This is considered really powerful since, as we learned in the Gojo vs. Sakuna fight, hand signs and incantations are a couple of the prerequisites to utilizing Jujutsu. Obviously, as a sorcerer, your general skill is determined by how much can you minimize those hand signs, the chanting of spells, incantations, etc. Because in battle, you need to be quick to unleash your attacks, right? You can't be chanting the incantations for so long and then boom you're dead before you can unleash Bruh. your attack when sorcerers skip the prerequisites it's not like you're losing a lot of the original power from your cursed technique it's just that you know doing those hand signs and incantations are what further amplifies that original power so to conclude all this sakuna's attacks can now always be used to its full capacity then we get some timeline lore of he and era sakuna as it says sakuna annihilated the elite celestial squad and the five void generals both who served under the food our Hoke branch. Alright, so in different translations, the Celestial Squad is known as the Sun, Moon, and Star Squad, if you read the Viz, and it was stated that Uro was once the captain of that group. As for the Five Void Generals, they're also a part of the Fujiwara branch, but was known to be defeated by Yorozu in the Heian era. So from a power scaling perspective, it basically tells us that Yorozu is way stronger than Uro, since Yorozu solo wiped a group that was stated to be shoulder to shoulder with Yorozu's group in terms of strength. And this insane feat is what permitted Yorozu to join the Fujiwaras after. So now learning that Sakuna destroyed both these groups once in the past, yeah, it makes sense why Uro was so frightened when sensing Sakuna's presence. She looked like a stray cat curling herself because, yeah, she's probably seen or experienced the terror that Sakuna <laughs> once brought forth to the Fujiwaras. Sakuna also pushed back one of the forces from the Abe clan, including Angel and the remnants of the Sugawara clan. Bruh. Guys, at this point, I feel like Gege has to give us a Hien era flashback just to flesh out some of these events and, you know, to visually see what it was like back then during the old ages. Because what I'm getting from all this and what you should get from all this is that Sukuna was simply a menace back then. I'm not gonna go over the lore or the details with the real life Sugawara clan or Michizina himself or even Angel with the Abe clan because, yeah, unless we get a Hien era flashback later in the story, I feel like right now these details aren't as important. That being said, we do get the name reveal of his trident, the weapon he held in the Hien era alongside the Vajra, and it's called the Hiten. Now, the name Hiten itself can refer to Apsara, celestial spirits depicted riding clouds and playing musical instruments around the Buddha. Obviously, I don't know how that would correlate with Sukuna's trident here, so I think the name Hiten is not something that gives direct hints or relations to the actual function of the weapon. I think we should focus more on the shape, appearance, and the history instead, which resembles the Trishula in Hinduism. The Trishula was known as a powerful weapon wielded by Lord Shiva. And after reading several different websites and Hindu texts on the internet, I found that most of them described the power of the Trishula to remove evil souls, darkness, sufferings, and whatnot. Apparently, it's well known in the religion that Shiva used the Trishula to cut off the head of his own son, Ganesha. So this could imply that Hiten was a weapon used by Sakuna to cut off the head of someone close to him or someone he actually cared about because there's a huge theory going on in the community that 
Wait, Sukuna had a twin brother? Especially considering that the last chapter revealed that Sukuna was an unwanted child, and we know that twins are a bad omen in JJK, so. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I'm not so keen on the Sukuna twin theory, but it definitely is possible. Nonetheless, getting his original body, learning the name of the trident, I think we're expected to see Sukuna bring out this weapon very soon, maybe even in the next chapter, who knows. Going back to the fight, however, Kashimo comes close quarters with Sukuna, but the four arms easily blocks and counters Kashimo in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Well, Sukuna is just so much stronger in this form because he can use two hands to defend and also use the other two hands to attack at the same time. It's almost not fair. Then Kashimo releases a new attack from his electricity, but Sukuna just destroys that attack with his world-cutting slashes. We see that the after effects are drawn in black, which if you compared it to Sukuna's old slashes, they were drawn normally as if they just cut through the area or target's location. So yeah, this new black AoE implies that Sukuna can now indeed cut through space or the world itself, it does get a chunk of Kashimo's right arm, meaning it was able to still hit Kashimo despite Sukuna warning him to dodge. So the cut comes extremely fast, almost impossible to evade upon facing it. Then Sukuna brings up Yorozu to Kashimo, and I'm gonna read their dialogue all together and then break down what Sukuna is saying after, just because it's more easier that way. So Sukuna explains to Kashimo that Yorozu was this fool who wanted to preach me about love since no one was on the same level as me, I must have been lonely, according to Yorozu. Sukuna continues to say that he understands what Yorozu meant, but it's quite annoying to hear someone else prattle on about what you don't know. However, her message would have been better conveyed to someone like you, Kashimo, and or Gojo Satru. So this dialogue explains that while Gojo was the strongest of the modern era, while Kashimo was the strongest of the Edo era, and while Sukuna was the strongest of the Heian era, all three of them are objectively lonely in different degrees, of course. But unlike Gojo and Kashimo, Sukuna doesn't feel lonely. There's a difference between someone being lonely and someone feeling lonely. This actually continues on later in the chapter, so we'll come back to this very soon. As Sukuna holds up the Vajra and uses it to strike Kashimo, since Kashimo's cursed energy trait is electricity, he has a resistance to electricity type attacks, but I think Sukuna used this more for distraction, because as soon as Sukuna shoots the streaks of lightning, Kashimo still moves away from the attack, though as he evades it, Sukuna comes right back. <laughs> behind Kashimo, like unnoticed, and just delivers the wombo combo on him. Like I said earlier, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, Sukuna's original form is like a cheat code. He sends Kashimo flying, but as Kashimo readies to immediately counterattack with his cursed technique, Sukuna unleashes a multitude of world-cutting slashes towards his way. Guys, if one of these slashes were difficult enough to dodge, nearly impossible, pretty much, then Bruh. how the hell do you dodge a net of these things coming your way? That's gotta be like an instant death. No way anyone survives this without a nerf or some special circumstance protecting them. As yeah, this unfortunately kills Kashimo. Then we get to my favorite part of the chapter, where we see Kashimo's inner dream sequence thing that sometimes happens in anime right before a character dies. Now, remember when we talked about earlier how both these three characters are lonely in different levels, but only Gojo and Kashimo are the strongest who feel lonely? What further emphasizes that is the fact that Kashimo is shown in his Edo period form with nobody around him. Remember when Jogo died in his inner dream sequence and he at least had Dagon and Hanami around him? Gojo also had people in the moment of his death, but like I said earlier, Gojo's loneliness isn't in the exact same stance as Kashimo. You know he for sure felt a sense of isolation via being the strongest because he even admits to himself that while I did have my friends and students at Jujutsu High, there was still this line drawn between me and other people, or rather me and living beings. Now, rephrasing to living beings instead of other people just further highlights how heavy the solitude that Gojo must have felt when he was alive. He goes on to say that you can admire a flower and help it bloom, referring to the students with Gojo helping them grow, but you can't ask those flowers to understand you. Because yeah, as he just said, he felt that there is always this line that separated Gojo from everyone else. And so, coming back to Kashimo, you can argue that Kashimo had it worse than Gojo, because at the very least, Gojo had company around. Kashimo had nobody, no connections. He viewed everyone to be as feeble as the dirt beneath him. So that's what Kashimo is seeking Sukuna's perspective on, is if loneliness is the punishment of being the strongest, and Sukuna simply answers that, why is there a need to feel lonely? You see, both Kashimo and Sukuna have faced challengers who gave it their heart and soul 
to fighting them. And for Sukuna, that's what quote unquote love is. That's why Gojo said after he died, the body I trained, the skills I learned, the senses I honed, I wanted to convey all of it to Sukuna. And I wanted that to reach him. And it did. Sukuna said that Gojo did well, and he'll be someone that Sukuna won't ever forget so long as he lives. So because they're the strongest, because they're the ones on top, they are loved by people. And those people who pour their heart and soul into fighting them, Sukuna answers back with the same love by meeting their eyes and acknowledging their strengths. If that's not showing kindness or affection, if that's not showing back love, then he doesn't know what else. That's why Sukuna calls Kashimo greedy, because he can't see that for himself. Think about it. All the people Kashimo slaughtered, all the people who wished to fight him, giving it their all, and Kashimo still cries about feeling lonely. Okay, I mean, obviously, we as the readers can understand but I can also understand even more now to why Sukuna would think that's a greedy behavior of Kashimo. That's why Sukuna, someone who knows no weakness, can still give affection to others because that's what love is to him. That's what doesn't keep Sukuna feeling lonely. And he goes on to say that because he understands it, that the actual meaning or term of love where you need this one person to fulfill yourself, that's worthless. His version of love is just an expression of oneself to another and has that returned in their deaths. Sukuna is content with just eating whenever he wants to eat. If someone's an eyesore, he'll kill it. If someone entertains him, he'll throw a bone like to a dog and play with them. That is the lifestyle that Sukuna chooses to live, and if it sounds strange to others, then he says it's simply their problem. This is kind of a callback to Yuji in chapter 214, when Sukuna said it was Yuji's own issue for being weak, as if, you know, how does it make sense that someone weak like Yuji is trying to blame some other person who's just living the life that matches his worth, right? Like, at the end of the day, this definitely sets up a potential narrative where, by the end of Jujutsu Kaisen, by the end of this story, Yuji is going to be the person who not fulfills Sukuna, because again, Sukuna doesn't need fulfillment, but Yuji will be the one in a thousand years to finally match up to Sukuna's worth and putting an end to his hedonistic lifestyle. Because with Sukuna also saying that humans are enough to suck on and kill time before I die, this tells us that Sukuna isn't someone who's desperately clinging on to life or, you know, wants to be some immortal living being. No, Sukuna understands that, yeah, he'll die at some point, and that's fine. He's not afraid of dying. He just wants to enjoy life as much as he can, maximize his pleasure, which humans are enough to do that. But coming back to the real world, Hikari's domain shell breaks out, and we see Hikari, Uraume, Yuji, and Higuruma pulling up to the battlefield. The chapter ends with Sukuna saying, just what do you think you'll be able to do? brat. Oh my god, what a cliffhanger, and obviously the hottest topic is Yuji's claws, so let's talk about that first. I think the biggest thing is not just the claws, but it seems like his entire forearm has changed. Like, obviously, there seems to be some bandages or cloth wrapped around the wrist, and then some layer of skin or material on the edges, and if you look at his elbow, the outline is shaped as if Yuji is wearing armor on his forearm. Yeah, I mean, at the very least, this is is something that Yuji can put on and off because during the Gojo versus Sakuna fight, we saw Yuji's hands at the broadcast room and his hands were normal. So I think it's best to go over some of the facts that the story has told us or has hinted about with Yuji's new gained powers. The first thing we can say for sure is that Yuji has more than one newly gained ability. The most obvious one is the soul switching. As before the Gojo versus Sakuna fight, we saw Yuji temporarily in Kusakabi's body while Kusakabi Kabe was in Yuji's, and I presume that Yuki's soul book was one of the main factors that helped form that ability. Potentially other factors too, like the idea that Yuji can eat any cursed objects and gain their powers, since he said that he'd eat anything to kill Sukuna. Of course, there's also a huge implication that Yuji ate the rest of the six death painting wombs to gain more strength and obtain new abilities, because in chapter 144, Chozo said he would return to get his brothers out of the 
the storehouse one day. And flash forward to chapter 220, where Yuji suddenly says thanks to Chozo, and Chozo replies, it's okay. But then Yuji says, no, I meant about the brothers. And Chozo says, it's fine, as long as they live on inside you, that's enough. So maybe the claws are from one of the powers of the six death painting wombs he ate, which could also explain why his entire forearm seems to be morphed, having like non-human skin, or the claws derived from another source, like Sukuna. We all know that infamous Gojo statement where he said that Yuji will soon inherit Sukuna's powers one day, and even if Sukuna is out of Yuji's body, Shoko doubles down on Gojo's statement in chapter 220 by saying that yeah, Yuji is still soaked in Sukuna's cursed energy because his own body is like a cursed object now, so the possibility of these claws coming from Sukuna could be true if it's not from Sukuna, not from eating a cursed object, or doesn't have anything to do with the soul, then I guess another possibility I've heard is being one of Yuta's weapons stored in Rika. Some people say this because, like I said, the bandages and armor that goes along with the claws, but yeah, other than that, those are just a few popular theories that make sense. If you have any other different suggestions on Yuji's new power-up or power-ups with a plural, then definitely let me know in the comments. As with Higuruma, man, I am so hyped to see how he and Yuji will team up with each other to face Sukuna. I actually have a bunch of ideas with Higuruma's court trial and how this could turn out to be a very interesting fight. A fight that at least lasts more than Kashimo's. But since there's a break next week, I'll definitely make it a separate video for you guys to consume while waiting for the next chapter. Now with Hikari, I feel like he will continue to fight Ruume, but with the domain breaking, I said in my spoiler video that maybe Hikari hit the jackpot because in this panel, Uraume's face seemed pissed while Hikari is still smiling or still grinning. So I don't know, that could imply that he landed a jackpot successfully or maybe not. I mean, Uraume could just be pissed because of all the rules that got info dumped into their head. I also wanted to check back on the Hikari versus Kashima fight and I noticed that when Hikari hits a jackpot, the domain is drawn to gradually disappear. Whereas in this chapter, the domain is shattered to pieces. So yeah, I guess that's like another evidence to support why Hikari probably didn't land a jackpot. I saw some people in my comments suggesting that the domain was broken by Sukuna's net slash that killed Kashimo. However, considering they were described to cut the world and space of what it touches, I feel like it would have still been able to hit Hikari and Uraume if that was the case because like if it hit Gojo despite having infinity, then it should have been able to hit Hikari and Uraume despite being inside a domain because the slash just cuts everything in that space, right? Nonetheless, this was a great chapter. I love what it did for Sukuna, and I'm excited to see Yuji come back in action. Like, I feel like it's been too long. Definitely let me know your thoughts of this chapter in the comment section down below. And with all that being said, thank you so much for watching my review, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.